in your mind, is there any cheat that you remember from all of your movies where you went, all right, what the hell? Just put it in there. We don't care. There's no continuity here. This is going to work. Not really. I mean, you know, it's it's a case by case basis. And, you know, when I'm when somebody points that out, I'm I'm have to say one of two things. One is I quote Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said a. Uh, a, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Okay. That's one. Mm -hmm. And I, I case, wish I said that <laughs> I'm going to use it probably okay. on my kids. You can quote Ralph Waldo Emerson. And then the other line that I use is, uh, yeah, you can post it on get a life.com. You tell me what, Kenny. Welcome to the Gary and Kenny Show. I'm Gary Kroger in Waterloo, Iowa. Joined as always by Kenneth Seisler in Calabasas. Calabasas. California. Yes. Uh, how are you, Ken? I'm well. How are you? I'm fine. Too. Well, enough about us. Can we move ahead? <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I know you are, and I am as well. Very excited about our guest today. So I think it's kind of important to. Uh, just get right into it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're very fortunate, Kenny, in this show. Mm -hmm. We've been around, what, a couple of years now? You mean on, on the podcast? The, yeah. Oh, we've been and, around a it little been while. that long? Because it seems longer. But <laughs> go ahead. Well, the point is, we get lots of interesting guests. We get mm -hmm. lots of, of people who have had distinguished careers in mm -hmm. entertainment. Mm -hmm. And getting the opportunity to talk to them is, is a real reward. Well, maybe we and, should get to that. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to be kind of a <laughs> fanboy today. Because, okay. um, well, our, our, Paul Hirsch is our guest. And mm -hmm. Paul, uh, well, he has a, an Academy Award as a film editor. And it's for a little film that maybe some of you have heard of called Star Wars. Uh, but his career includes also The Empire Strikes Back and seminal films like Carrie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Footloose, Falling Down, Trains, Planes, Planes and Automobiles, Mission Impossible, the list goes on. He's worked with George Lucas, obviously, uh, uh, John Hughes, Joel Schumacher, Brian De Palma. Uh, it's a real who's who of directors. He's also an author. But let's welcome, if you would, Paul Hirsch. Hi, Paul. Hi. Hi, guys. Would you tell people what the book is? Because I just finished reading it. I think you just finished reading it. Let's tell people what the book is. The title of the book is A Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far, Far Away. <laughs> and it's available on Amazon and on uh, Audible if you like to have people read to you. Well, it is impossible to be uh, alive in the past 50 years without having <laughs> right. seen one of Paul movies edited by uh, Mr. Hirsch. Paul, I'm going to start with this very quickly. I want to explain my fanboy thing. When I was a young man, when Star Wars came out, I didn't know what an editor was. I thought, why on earth would an editor even get an Academy Award. That's right. not the sc screenwriter. It's not the actor. It's not the director. What's, what's an editor? The Academy is covering that too. <laughs> you won the Academy Award and they played a sequence from Star Wars. And I believe it's when the uh, uh, garbage bin door closes and then you see a stormtrooper's foot slam onto the, uh, the mesh, onto the, the, the railing. And I realized as I watched this that film editing is the pace, it's the drama, it's the mood, it's 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 telling a, the, a musical visual story. And I got it from your work. So that's why I'm sort of, you know, mush mouth today because I can't believe I'm meeting you. Well, that's, that's very gratifying. Thank you for that. Let's go back to the Academy, Paul, because they yeah. just made news regarding the editors. Yeah, I was referring to that. Yeah, did you uh, do you have any uh, strong feelings about it, or you want to, you know? Well, I think you know. Uh, look, uh, uh, some people are more upset about it than I am. I think the deal is, if you get an Academy Award, you get a gold statue, you get to be called Academy Award winning whatever for the rest of your life, and you get to be on TV. Uh, as they describe what they have planned. We're still going to be on TV. It's That's just right. that they've rearranged this, the award ceremony in some way. So I'm, I'm reserving judgment until I see what they do. But to be singled out, you know, as uh, not to be televised live, 
um, suggests a kind of second class status to those groups. And it's insulting, you know, but uh, editors have suffered worse. Well, you know, I wonder whether or not even the getting an Oscar has lost some of its, you know, shine as well. I, don't, I mean, more people say it's a number one hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes rather than they say it won an Academy Award. It really feels that way to, to me. I mean, things have changed dramatically. We'll get into the because we'll be two uh, a bunch of old white people complaining about how they <laughs> fucked up movies nowadays. I want to get into that. But let's get right into the, the thing about editing. You quote in your book, Michelangelo. And yeah. you say, beauty is the purgation of the superfluities, meaning you cut out all the bad shit. Superfluities. The superfluities, thank you. Films, you get rid of all the stuff you don't need. Right. You say films run so long, you identify the uh, superfluous, and the, what remains is a good version of the film. Right. I looked at the years that you won the Academy Award for Star Wars, only one movie came in at two minutes, two hours and one minute, and that was Star Wars. This year, every single one of the awards is coming in at two and a half hours. Yeah. If not longer. Yeah. Uh, your thoughts on that? They're too long. Yeah. <laughs> but why? Why? Why is that? Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think directors who have ambitions to win Academy Awards have looked at the his, the history of these uh of the awards and seen that long movies tend to win awards oh like gandhi i don't think you can argue that gandhi was the best picture that year i forget what it was up against but maybe et or something you know et e is uh i thought a brilliant movie and uh you know uh shakespeare didn't say to say things in the fewest words possible is the essence of being funny. He said, brevity is the soul of wit. <laughs> right. right. You have to find ways to express yourself uh, in, you know, in briefer terms, and it has more punch. It has more, it has more weight. Um, uh, the pictures today are kind of flabby, I find. Not all, well, you know, not all, but, but many are. And, and um, just out of curiosity, what have you seen lately that you really love? And it's specifically from an editor's point of view. Um, I thought Summer of Soul was brilliant. I thought that was a terrific picture. I didn't. I haven't even heard of it, to be honest with you. It's a documentary about a um, music festival in Harlem the summer of 1969 that was shot at the time and never released. And... Um, sat on a shelf for 50 years, 50 years. And wow. it's got performances by Stevie Wonder and- Oh, I Guys did hear Knight about this. The Temptations and, and David Ruffin and, and uh, Mango Santa Maria and, and Hugh Masekila and, and on and on and on. And uh, Mahalia Jackson is extraordinary. I mean- uh, What about in the non-documentary world of movies that you've okay, seen? Okay, well, um, from an editing standpoint, oh, you're testing me. <laughs> well, it's not a test. Um, it just, you know. I saw a picture that, that I thought was very well done, uh, but it was made in 2020 and it sort of escaped notice. It was called Riders of Justice, hmm. a Scandinavian film with Mads, Mads Mikkelsen. And uh, it's really terrific. Uh, I thought that was really good. I thought... I actually thought uh, Don't Look Up was yeah. uh, an impressive feat of editing. Yeah, well, I love that movie. That sort of begs the question, Paul. Uh, yeah. is, is there an editor like that, that their work is something that you simply have to see? I mean, there are probably several, but I wonder if there are one or two that you're like, you know, I, I love their work and I have to see this film. Uh, uh not anymore. I think when I was younger, I sought them out, but now I have other things on my mind. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, well, welcome to the club. I'm just curious, does Christopher yeah. Rouse's work, does that speak to you? You know, it's that new, it's not even new anymore, but it's that action movement camera, uh, born identity, born supremacy, yeah. uh, United 93. Does that speak to you? Yeah, he's very good at that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Is that something that, is that almost another art form? 
no. as an editor? No. No, it's just, uh, you know, those kind of movies, you got to keep the ball in the air, and he's very good at that. Yeah. Uh, he's not the only one, but he is very good at it. Um, Tom Cross is a young editor whose work I've admired. Okay. Um, the guy who cuts for, uh, the two guys who cut for Edgar Wright, Paul something, I forget their names. They're really good. Uh, Edgar Wright's movies are always interesting. They're, they're well cut, but they, they tend to be uh, on the long side for my taste. Um, but that he's so skillful as a filmmaker, it's, you know. I don't want to go through a chronology of all your movies because I don't know. Have you done accounting? How many is 40, 50? 40, movies? probably. 40 movies? Uh, Plus TV yeah, work. In your, but your, your first hit, as you call it, your first hit was Carrie. Yes. Uh, you also say later in the book that if when you watched it last, you wouldn't change a thing. Right. Are there movies that you've done that you go, boy, would I like to change a lot? <laughs> um, at the time, yes. At now, no. Oh, that's interesting. Now, why no now? Uh, I have other things on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's you just not that clear. important to you anymore. No. Look, I, I'm a novice. I'm not. I, I was an actor for years. Kenny, you edit. You're a mm -hmm. director. And Paul, mm -hmm. you're an extraordinary editor, obviously. I, 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 don't, I know nothing. Okay. But I'm a Star Wars fan. And I remember reading in your book, or actually, it may have been in an interview that I saw with you, you said that you'd done the rough and and Lucas came in and said, hey, I, I want to save Darth Vader at the end. I want him spinning off into space or something. And you said, well, that reeks of kind of sequely, doesn't it? Yeah. Do you recall that? Story? Yeah. Are you telling me that the original story in the script, it was a one off that there wasn't going to be a sequel? Well, George always intended for it to be a longer story. But um, that's the difference between someone like me and someone like George Lucas. You know, he, he is a visionary of a different magnitude. And, um, you know, I'm coming from a different place. I was working intensely on this one project and wasn't thinking about uh, possible sequels. George clearly was. He, he told me while we were cutting the film that he had mapped out the story of three trilogies. Um, and we used to fantasize about, you know, wait 30 years and bring the actors back when they're old. Um, <laughs> in fact, that's what happened, you know. So, okay, a visionary uh, for sure. Well, so now you went on to do The Empire Strikes Back, and that's, of yes. course, with Irvin Kirshner. What's yes. it like when you're working with the the person who came up with this universe? You've got to stay true to the universe, and I would imagine somewhat to the style that you created, but now you've got a new visionary. Yeah. How, how does that transition work? When do you come into the language of Kirshner as opposed to Lucas? Well, um, Kirsch was a very experienced uh, director. He had been a photographer before that. And uh, he worked with the actors in a way that was very different from George. He, you know, he, um, he was a, a, bit, a bit of an eccentric himself. Um, but working with him was, you know, it was stimulating. Um, he would use my cutting room as a place to blow off steam. <laughs> Come in from the set angry about something or other. He'd storm around ranting and then walk out again without even having ever addressed me. And you know, he would just <laughs> come in and yell and, and leave. Uh, but, um, you know, he was smart about things. And uh, he had gotten the job because he had directed a picture called this. Uh, I forget the, the title, but it was the sequel to A Man Called Horse with Richard Harris. And it's really good. I mean, if you see both pictures, you think, yeah. well, you know, the second one's really, yeah, really good. Yeah. So he had worked with a guy named Matt Robbins, Matthew Robbins, who was a friend of George. And uh, Matthew recommended him and they met and that's how it happened. So and Kirsch was very experienced and knew how to direct. And, um, you know, he had, uh, there, there, there are people who direct, who I would say are not directors. They have the job, but they're not directors. So they'll shoot everything in sight without any idea how it's going to go together later. And uh, Fix it in post. Make it in post. <laughs> Make it in post, yeah. And um, 
I don't have any respect for those people. No, it's, but I, you know, I worked with De Palma, and um, he's a real director. I mean, what, whatever you think of his, of his work, his style, whatever, he's a brilliant visualist. Mm -hmm. uh, finds ways to tell stories and images. Uh, it's very rare. Um, but you know, you say, you know, like I just saw a picture that Steve Soderbergh directed, uh, which is very visual and. And really good it's called kimmy have you seen that kimmy no oh I that's haven't. just on now isn't it yeah yeah i want to check that out let me it's, there, there's going to be if anybody who's a fan of star wars and all of these things there's enormous amount of tidbits in your book that are just really fun oh, good. Uh, my favorite and i know it probably isn't anybody's favorite but i got a kick out of it was you remembered that when you went out to the hamburger hamlet with george lucas yeah. he had a hamburger and milk cheeseburger a cheeseburger and milk. and milk. A glass of milk, yeah. A glass of, now that struck me because I'm Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> so I immediately got, oh my God, the man had meat and dairy together. And you put that in the book. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. And you know what, Ken? What? He's not Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of town. Well, the other thing I what was interesting, well, I think he leaves on Lucas Lane, but it has nothing to do with uh, his name, right? Lucas Oil. Lucas Valley. Lucas, oh, Lucas Valley. Valley. He lives in Lucas Valley, but has nothing to do with that. Right. Um, I love the, his dog's name was Indiana. Yes. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff like that. And here's a, another question I have that you mentioned. The producer of the original Star Wars, Gary Kurtz, walks into you with, and says, hey, I have a baseball cap, a Star Wars baseball cap. Right. Anybody want one? And you say, yeah, I'll take one of everything. Yes. Do you have a Trevor treasure trove? Of boxes and, and paraphernalia, how much is yes, and in you your house of Star Wars it. paraphernalia. Okay, my daughter was born during Star Wars, and my son was born during Empire Strikes Back. And the first year when Star Wars opened, um, they couldn't get the toys into production quickly enough. So at Christmas time of that year, now it opened in May, right? By Christmas time, which is seven months later, they had to hand out coupons that people could redeem for the toys when they became available right mm -hmm. so um there weren't any toys in the stores and uh i had i had gone back to new york i was based in new york at the time i'd gone back with my family back to the city and uh, one day a carton arrives about three feet tall and two feet square and I open it up and it's filled with star wars stuff and my daughter immediately starts playing with it all. And for the next couple of years, every few months, we would get another carton of Star Wars stuff. And my wife insisted that we let the kids play with it. So it's all scattered. And uh, at some point, my wife, who, whom I love dearly, we've been married, will be 48 years this June. Congratulations. Uh, Jane has trouble throwing anything away except Star Wars. Toys. <laughs> She's smart. <laughs> you can put ch grandchildren through college with with that uh, paraphernalia. Wait, are you saying she did get she threw away everything? She did not throw away any Star Wars stuff, right? No, I'm saying the only thing she could throw away was Star Wars. Oh, toys. she did. Oh, she. <sighs> yeah, that's what I thought I heard, Gary. He's uh, saying that, uh, that she I got it got wrong. Rid of that. I, I yeah. guess I, I, I couldn't she hear it. I wouldn't allow it. myself to hear that. She collects bits of string and says, oh. you know, and throws away all oh, this Star Wars toy. The kids oh, are grown now. Oh, that, that, that pains me. Hey, I want to go back to basics a little bit. I want to, because I, I'm trying to understand some things. You talk about in your book, every director has its language and their do's and don'ts. One director says, never go from a master into the close up. Lucas right. says, I hate when you hear dialogue over a panning shot because buildings don't talk. Right. How do you, as an editor, adjust your own sensibilities to the, the, the rules that each director has? Well, you just, you just do what they tell you. They don't, you know, you avoid doing what they don't like. Um, so you learn it rather quickly. Well, yeah, you, I don't like knowing. doing it, I won't do it again. Um, you know, we're there to, to uh, help the director accomplish their vision. Mm -hmm. Of course, if they don't have a vision and they can't make decisions, then it's a terrible experience. And the but person, I, is, not, the person yeah. is not worthy of being called a director. 
Uh, I've worked on pictures where I get dailies where uh, everything seems to be shot 40 different ways. Yeah. There's no notes explaining what they had in mind. And then you put it together based on your own sensibility, figuring, that, well, I guess, you know, this will work. And you make a version of it. And then you show it to them and they say, no, it's all wrong. How much do you use, or if you use at all, the script? Do you, do, do you look at the original shooting script? Is oh, that yeah. a guide? Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to have a starting place when you're cutting a picture. And my starting place is always include everything that was shot. Use all the angles. They must have been shot for a reason, except in the case of these people mm -hmm. who are not directors and they just cover themselves. Covering their ass, yeah. Um, but usually a director shoots a, a, an angle for a reason. You have to figure out what they had in mind and why they shot it and figure out the best way to use that angle. And then in the first cut, you include everything. Cause you know, going back to Michelangelo, you have to take away everything that doesn't look like David. So, you know, uh, you want to include everything. So you know what you're working with. Is this available to me? Is that available to me? You don't want to have to think about that. What, what did I cut out that that's no longer in that I might resort to you. You want to start with everything in front of you when you, when you start cutting the picture down. So, the first cut, which is called the editor's cut, is not really what the editor, what this editor would do with the picture if I had to deliver a final cut. It's a starting point. You know, it's, it's looked at everything and where is it long? Where is it fat? Mm -hmm. you know, what can we take out? What's getting in the way? What, what's, what's illogical? What's too soon? What's too late? What's too fast? What's too slow? You know, you look at it, all, all this... I call it, it's like, uh, it's like playing what's, what's wrong with this picture. You know, those, <laughs> those games in the newspaper, they just have a picture and they say, what's wrong with this picture? You know, and you say, well, the cow is on the roof, you know, and the, the car has three wheels in front and, you know, whatever it is. So you're looking for things that are wrong. And when you're cutting a film, you look at it constantly and you look for th things that, that ping you that, that, oh, that doesn't seem right. What's wrong there? It's too, it's, it's coming late. That timing isn't right. Uh, and on and on, you know. So. I don't know how you well you would do in some of the editing rooms today with some of these directors because they seem to be a little bit more self indulgent to me. All of the uh, things that you talked about, I agree completely, but I feel as though watching these movies that uh, they're just hang they're they're more concerned about whether it's you're saying doing a long movie to, to win an Academy Award and, and all of those things. But boy, it seems like a very different. Uh, type of movie making to me, to me today. So many things in your book that you talk about, plausibility. I think you made, there's a quote, and there's a great quote and I love it, is about whether or not the movie that you're doing, is it, is it plausible or whatever, is, is the acting, I think the quote is, is the acting should be believable and the action should be believable. Well, I was just talking about, I worked with a director whose only superlatives were unbelievable and incredible. And it struck me as kind of funny that he'd talk about the acting being incredible. You want the acting to be credible. Right. You know, the, you, the special effects are unbelievable. Well, they should be believable. That's all. It was just commenting on his uh, choice of support. Right. And, but that's one of the things that bothers me about some movies that I watch nowadays is that the plausibility of the action, because you have special effects nowadays, you don't have to be plausible in terms of physics or action or whatever. You just do anything that's that's in anybody's imagination because it all can be created by visual effects. Would yes. you agree? Yes. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, do you, does that bother you when you watch a movie nowadays and go, you know what? I don't know. You know, I tend, uh, there, there's so many, so many factors in, in a person's enjoyment of a movie. There are times when you just let things go that, you know, yeah, it bothers you, but it's not that important, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been watching a, a series, although I'm getting tired of it now. Uh, started watching a series called Raised by Wolves. I'm like, I've been mm -hmm. watching it. I watched it last night. And uh, the visuals are extraordinary. And the first show is just sort of dazzling. And then you get to the second show, and it's only half as dazzling because you've already seen the first show. And now, <laughs> right. Right. And then the longer you go on into the series, you know, now it starts relying on the story and the characters and you sort of get used to the environment and the rules and so forth. But they have these ships that fly around. There's no visible means of propulsion. You think, well, that's silly. You know? Well, I don't, mind, I don't mind that in science fiction. Science fiction, I think you could do anything. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll give you an example. And the reason I brought this up was because you did um, 
uh, Mission Impossible, and I believe it was the Mission Impossible one or Ghost Protocol, where Tom uh, Cruise is in uh, the channel and there's a helicopter following him in the channel. And at one point he is on the train and he's got, I guess, an explosive in his hand and he jumps from the train to the helicopter. Yeah. He's on the helicopter. Now he takes the explosion explosive device. Yeah. And he puts it on the helicopter. Right. And then the helicopter explodes. Yeah. You did that once, right, Kenny? No, but anyhow, it explodes. Yes. The good news is the helicopter blew up and the bad guy blew up. The yeah. bit. Ba- the other amazing good news is instead of it blowing up Tom Cruise, the explosion propelled him to safety. Back onto the train. Back onto the train. So you're saying that's impossible. Is that I'm saying, saying that Kenny? that was a moment in that movie. And now I know it's kind of science fiction. It was ridiculous. But I'm just going to say I'm curious whether or not that pinged you when you were making the movie or just no, it doesn't matter. It's just action. Uh, honestly, I thought it was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I did, too. <laughs> So did most of America, but I'm just pointing out. I'm just want to. I have this I mean, the whole idea of a helicopter chase inside a tunnel. Is I mean, amazing. Yeah, it's it, it's all crazy. No, speaking I get of, that. Speaking of Tom Cruise, you talked about is either Ghost Protocol or the first Mission Impossible. He came to a final edit or whatever, and and his comment was, "You you got everybody going in the door and going out the door." Yeah, yeah and you said it, he wasn't editorializing, but what did that mean exactly? He said, "Oh, I see you kept. I see, I see you still have all the exits and entrances." Yeah. And I'd never thought of that in those terms. I mean, and I started thinking, yeah, do we need them all? You know, and I started, went back and sort of looked at it. And I thought, well, what if you cut out the exit? You just cut at the end of the line or something and not show him walk out. Right. Or what if you pick him up just before he speaks, as opposed to having him come in the door and then right. start speaking. And um, it was, it was uh, helpful. And so you made some of those changes. So was that kind of an aha moment, thanks to Tom Cruise in in your Uh, editing style? Listen, Tom knows more about filmmaking than anybody I've ever met. And he knows you can put an explosive can on a helicopter and not die when it goes. I'm just going to let you know, just in the future, I will not be attempting that. (laughs) Hey, Paul. There's an audience that's going to be disappointed. (laughs) <laughs> One of the things that I loved about your book is the way that you tell your story and your personal connection, your experience from just running film in New York and then getting your fingers on it and your love of the movie Ola and the tactile experience of yeah. cutting a movie. Yeah, well, like that, is, that has changed somewhat, the art of it, right? The technology. Is it the same thrill? Do you get the same feeling that when you were splicing that you had in the old days? I wouldn't say it was a thrill, but it was a satisfaction of knowing that you were skillful at something, you know, required skill as opposed to just judgment or, uh, you know, you still you still have to bring to bear judgment and timing and so forth. But uh, to be making splices and unmaking them and remaking them and doing this in a rhythm that kept, uh, you know, some people were slow and I, I was considered pretty quick. And, well, I found your telling of it very, forgive me for the word seductive, but it, it made me, it, it was like being a painter with a brush on the canvas. And it really, I felt the creative juices. And so I really related to your, uh, your descriptions of how you cut and splice film and pull down the different reels and look at them all. And Yeah, when I started working on computers, I thought, to me, it was like an automatic splicing machine. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be able to go really fast now. I said, won't have to make and unmake all these splices. You can do it virtually, just hit a button. And uh, if you want to extend the shot, you don't have to go look for the the trim that's in the yeah. shelf somewhere, you know. So it sped things up quite a lot. Um, but again... But you have an affection for those because you remember every device, every machine that you use to edit on, in every movie, you will say, I edited this one on the movie Ola. I edited this one on the flatbed. This yeah. was the can. You remember every single movie, uh, that how you edited it and what machine you edited it on. And you have a great affection for, I'm not sure if you love the movie Ola more than the flatbed, but uh, no. Okay. But here's my question because you do have a real, um, you talk about in the movie, in your book a lot. It's, it's interesting. Do you have any of these machines in your home? 
No. No. So when was the last time you saw a movieola or a flatbed? Or a chem or a Steenbeck? I don't even know what you. Yeah, I, I, I read about those in his book. Right. I know. But I mean, I, don't I, I know. But you re certainly remember on every movie he will say, and I cut it on this one and I cut it on this one. Or this person had this one. Even in Star Wars, at one point, he, he talks to uh, 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 George Lucas's wife and they exchange awesome. machines because he yeah. prefers another machine. Yeah. Yeah. Made it a difference. Years. It had been years since I'd worked on a movie. Ola. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, she was working on a flatbed and I was miserable. I was rolling over the film with my chair and, you know, it was just <laughs> uh, the muscle memory had gone, you know. So I offered, they had said to me, can you work on a movie? Oh, I said, sure, no problem. Well, then when I started doing it, I realized I'm sort of hopeless. And I offered to rent a flatbed out of my own salary. I was so miserable. <laughs> and Marsha said, oh, you don't do that. Just take my machine, you know. <laughs> and 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 what was the first uh, a digital uh, format that you work on? Uh, I worked on a, a machine called Lightworks. I remember Lightworks. Okay. And it how quickly it. did you adjust to it? Because I, I I found it difficult. It took me about a week. No kidding. Okay. So yeah. you you were technically uh, proficient to go to digital. Well, you know, the thing about uh, moving from from film to digital was lightworks had a a timeline that as i interpreted it at the time was an imaginary piece of film and an imaginary piece of sound so and i would make imaginary splices and i had a uh, an assistant editor who was familiar with the with the uh, program mm -hmm. sitting next to me and i would say i want to do this All right and okay how do you do that and he'd tell me and then right. uh when you're assembling a film for the first time you're only making about five or six different moves. You know, you just, mm -hmm. you're repeating it again and again and again. I want to go mm -hmm. in, I want to take this piece and put it into the timeline. I want to take the next piece and put it into the timeline. So you learn how to do that. That's pretty simple. And then I want to move this over here and I want to insert this over here. And then there's only about five or six different things that you do when you're assembling a film. Mm -hmm. So you do that over and over, you, you know, it's very easy to pick up. Yeah. Something I think would be very important to anybody who's interested in becoming an editor in this book is the editor's code. I was there's just going to bring up of, the editor's there's code. There's a lot of lessons to be taught on dealing with directors and producers. I and want to you to tell this one story, Paul, because you talk about Carrie and Brian De Palma is going to Europe and he says, let no one see this cut right. of, of Carrie. And then, of right. course, the producer says, I want to see the cut. And if you don't show it to me, you're fired. You right. wouldn't show him because of right. the editor's code, your your allegiance. Yeah. And he fired you. Right. But Brian De Palma gets on the phone and you get Do you ever figure out wh what Brian De Palma said <laughs> to get your job back? He probably said, I told him to do that. And I want to work, you know, I I don't know. It's right. Yeah. You know, the producer was pissed off and, and fired me out of peak. But he realized that if Brian wants to work with me, he's got no choice. Yeah. Well, you got fired and you got rehired in the space of about 48 hours. And I just found that. You well, know, I think, I think, I mean, I don't, uh, uh, Paul can tell it. What would you, if you had to say to uh, a group of uh, editors out there that you were teaching, what the editor's code would be, what would you, how would you say it? Well, you know, it, you have to be loyal to the person who hired you. Uh, Initially, all my jobs came from the editor, from the director, so my loyalty was the director. Later on, it got a little bit more complicated because, for instance, on Empire Strikes Back, uh, I had worked with George, who was now the executive producer, and uh, Kirsch was the director, but it was George who had hired me, essentially. He told Kirsch, you know, Paul's going to edit this film. And Kirsch probably said, fine, you know. Um, but you know the the loyalties get a little complicated when uh, it also parallels a a pattern that that happened in the industry, which was uh, when these guys that I worked with as young directors, uh, De Palma, Lucas, and almost worked with Scorsese and Spielberg. These guys came along at a time when Hollywood was sort of 
fumbling along and all of a sudden these new guys came in and Coppola too and you know and they sort of revived Hollywood and the studios gave them extraordinary uh, leeway and power and, and freedom um, of course that sort of came to an end when uh, Chimino made Heaven's Gate and almost <laughs> bankrupted the studio but mm. for a while there the directors were the key ingredient in any creative package and the yeah. director had a hit the studios would come to them and they'd say what do you want to do next you know and um, and the directors would sort of steer the, their careers but you know now they they have there are some key moments in the history of film that I think were damaging. One is when the word creative became a noun. Mm. You know, all my life creative was an adjective. Yeah. All of a sudden now we have the creatives. The creatives. He's a creative. She's a creative. Right. You know, and these creatives, you know, young people at a studio would sit around and they develop projects and then they'd cast the director like casting an, an actor in the lead, you know. Who can we get to direct our movie? And um, so this is what you get, you know? So uh, the other thing was when they stopped making movies and TV and started making content. Because content implies that, you know, uh, going back to Marshall McLuhan, film is a medium. A medium is a carrier of information. Each cut of film contains visual information and sound information so the medium is film the 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 information uh didn't wasn't called content at the time but that's what it became but the idea of content means uh, implies you're filling something exactly yeah it's contained within something and today it's we want to have a 10-hour series netflix wants to make this into a you know 10-hour show and they start pulling the material like taffy to fill right. up to fill up these big bins of time right that, right that's been predetermined as the this is how the story the story's going to run 10 hours you know and the writer and the story doesn't even exist yet scratching their heads figuring out how to make this four hour story into a 10 hour story you know but when you start thinking about it as content uh you got the you know it's as backwards in my opinion you know a story should find its own length as a beginning, a middle and an end. And, um, you know, it shouldn't be predetermined to a, to a pre-assigned time. You know? Well, let me ask you a question then. And, and talking about story, because you've, you've hit all the genres, you've been science fiction, you you've done comedy, you know, trains, planes, and automobiles, sort of a romantic comedy, a, a relationship comedy, Ferris Bueller's day off falling down, something completely different. Do you have a system in your mind that's, this is a vague question, but I, I want an answer. How, how do you determine the difference in terms of the timing of the over the shoulder, the jump cut or whatever, whether it's a comedy or a drama? I mean, maybe I answered my own question, but I just want to hear from Paul Hirsch. How do you approach each differently? Is it a different set of rules? No, I mean, I apply my sensibility to whatever I'm working on. And the only thing you can do uh, is follow your own instinct. And uh, at first I was copying, you know, when I first started out, I didn't know where to cut. I, you know, nobody told me where to cut. I started out cutting trailers. Trailers, everything's pre-cut. Yeah. So I could take something that was pre-cut and spiff it up and, you know, make it into something but uh when i first started cutting dailies where there was no indication of where to cut i was kind of lost i thought well you know it took me a while to figure it out um but you know if you rely on your own and i tried to make the dailies when i cut them together i tried to make it look kind of like a movie right <laughs> so right that was my goal make it look like a movie um but you know you keep at it and you follow your instincts and if your instincts are good, are good, then you will So go. part of what makes Ferris Bueller funny in this moment is because Paul Hirsch, this is his sense of humor, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or what you find dramatic. This and, works for me and I'm going to try it this way. Yeah, and, but I mean, keeping in mind that everything we, I do is a suggestion. Yeah. You know, and subject to review and revision by the only artist on the film who's empowered to make decisions, which is the director. 
Right. So you have incredibly talented composers, cinematographers, costumers, art directors, editors, you know, all these people, everything they do is in the nature of a suggestion. Mm -hmm. It's the fact of doing it is a suggestion. If I'm cut from this to this, that's a suggestion. He can, he, she can always change what I've done. Um, you mentioned Ferris Bueller. Uh, yeah. You even say that today you get more people being impressed that you edited Ferris Bueller than Star Wars. Well, no, I would say it's second. Oh, second? it's second. Okay. That that and planes, trains, and automobiles. Yes, which but, I was surprised but, in your yes. book that that was not a hit when it came out. Yeah, it's very disappointing. It became a Christmas hit, but it is now. I mean, everybody has it in their collection. Yeah. No, no, it's. Uh, you know John Hughes. Me? Can you talk about John Hughes? I don't. Yeah. People don't know. Uh, uh, him today, but boy, he made some iconic movies. Uh, and you also say he was very funny in the editing room. Oh my God. It's the funniest. The long thing. takes, right? Long takes. Oh, he never yelled cut. <laughs> <laughs> that had to be cut. difficult. Very, very. Yeah. He, and then we were on film in those days. So he would shoot, uh, for instance, there's a scene uh, in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles where um, Candy offers to give Steve Martin a lift to a motel. He says, come with me. I'm sure Gus will fix you up with a room. So they, then they cut to the cab. And uh, in the script, the scene is, um, Martin, Martin says something like, why is this taking so long? And, uh, and uh, Candy says to the cab driver, he says, how come, uh, Doobie, the cab driver's name is Doobie. He says, Doobie, uh, how, you know, why are we going this way? He says, well, on the interstate, all you see is the interstate. You, you said your friend here had never seen, uh, never been to Wichita, and I thought I'd show him around, you know? And Steve says, but it's night. <laughs> so so that, that was the scene. That, two lines in the script, you know? It was like quarter page or something. So... I get, I get a, uh, a wide shot from the front of the car, showing the three guys. The two are in the back and the Doobie in the front. Then I get a close-up of Doobie. Then I get a close-up of Doobie from over the rear seat, as if you know, he turns around when he's talking to them. So there's that. And then there's a two-shot of the guys in the seat. And there's a raking two-shot from one side, a raking two-shot from the other side. Then there's a... Uh, raking close up on each guy <laughs> and then a front on close up on each oh, guy. Right. You got and every he had take, coverage, and every take is a thousand feet oh, <laughs> because John would say, Okay, do it again, take it from the top, or whatever. And you know, when you're looking at a close up, there's no indication of whether where you are in the scene right well, when he right, did a right, slate right. in between when he would say no, do it again no, he no, won't no, allow a slate no, see that no, that's no, murder no, when they just a close-up yeah so you, so you, know, you don't know yeah and then, and then there might be two or three takes of each angle yeah yeah so we wound up with you know something like four hours of dailies for a, a quarter page in the script you know and, and I love in the, when you're talking to him the first thing you said when you heard about the movie was you're not going to keep that name are you <laughs> that was Ferris. Yeah. Uh, was Ferris. Now, now, you also created what for me is the funniest moment on film. And that is also in a, in a vehicle. You're going the wrong way. <laughs> and they start, oh, yeah, okay. To this moment, if I'm on an island, I have that piece of film. Thanks to you. There was a gag that we cut out that I, I, I wanted to have in, but John, John wouldn't go for it. So... They're yelling at each other across the median, right? They're racing along the freeway. Steve turns to to uh, Candy. He says, "He says, what do you say?" He says, "He wants to know who wrote the bell jar." <laughs> he says, "What?" He says, "He wants to know who wrote the bell jar." He says, "Uh, that was uh, I forget the I forget who he came up with, you know, Dorothy Parker." Okay. He says, Dorothy Parker. You know, and then they go through between the trucks and everything, and they, they slam on the brakes, and Steve's fingers are in the <laughs> dashboard, and he has to pull them out, you know. And, and he turns to Candy, and he says, Dorothy Parker didn't write <laughs> Belcher. Oh, that was still a laugh. <laughs> and, of course, 
the hands between the pillows. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I have a friend who teaches uh, uh, film editing at one of the schools. He told me he showed that scene to his class and they didn't laugh. Really? The new age, guys. Really? That's... Well, <laughs> to me, that's universal and, and eternal. <laughs> well, funny. They, but they I, need... I understand, oh. you know, that, you know. Homophobic jokes don't fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, okay, and, I get it. I will ask, the car that gets destroyed at uh, the house, the one that they're yeah. trying to put the mileage on? Yeah, it was a copy. It's a copy. That was my question. Okay. Yeah. If you were to say to because you know one of the things we like to get out of the show paul is we, we stream it on a lot of different platforms and we found that young people young people there's um who are interested in the disciplines of entertainment like yeah. to watch our show because our guests we like to have fun and hear stories but we get some really interesting information going back to the young paul hirsch in new york who gets this idea to be a filmmaker to be an editor what would you say what would your final comment be to a, a, a class of, of young filmmakers well, that, that what want would, to be an editor? What would you, Paul Hirsch, tell the young Paul Hirsch? Well, there you go. That's a better way to phrase it. Follow your instincts. You know, I, had a, I had a guy write me recently. He said, what would you advise? I said, follow your instincts. If your instincts are good, then you will go far. If your instincts are not good, perhaps you'd be better suited to a different profession. <laughs> That, well, yeah, but most you, you also say, and I got a lot of quotes from your book, and I apologize for it, but I, oh, I, no, no, I no. listen. Hey, I love it. Okay. <laughs> is you say this, never care about a movie more than the director. Yeah. Yeah. I've learned Interesting. That. What does that mean? Well, when you work on a picture, it, it takes over. You know, I, I call editors uh, host organisms. <laughs> we, okay. We, we it's a good I mean, concept works. We carry these movies in our heads, you know, and, and you go to sleep thinking about it. You wake up thinking about it. You think about it in the shower. It's always on, you know, it's always in there and on your mind. And you do get obsessed with it. And sometimes you think, wow, this is a great idea, you know. And, and uh, you know, there were times when I got over enthusiastic about an idea and sort of pushed, uh, how shall I say, put, pushed forward an idea that the producers didn't care for. And if the director's not going to fight for it, you can't fight for an idea that, you know, if I go up against a producer and I don't have the director's support, then it's a problem. And I learned that the hard way. Didn't you once go in with Mike Metavoy, who asked for your opinion? You gave oh, yeah, it. That was, on, and you, that was on Carrie. That was on Carrie. And yeah. you gave it. And he said, oh, you're just supporting De Palma. And you said, no, I actually feel this way. Yeah, but he was right. He said, I don't yeah. know. he said, I, I don't know why I'm even asking you. You're just going to support Brian. You know? like, so it was a, yeah. Well, he was right, but I was right too. I, I really believed what I was saying. Yeah. Two people can be right. Uh, well, well you, there's a thought for the ages. Yeah. <laughs> well, you certainly have been in the room where it happened. I mean, I'm just looking at, I mean, you, were, you, you, you edited Footloose. Yeah. My goodness. Herbert, I did four pictures with Herbert. He was quite a character. Herbert Ross, folks, yeah. is who we're talking about. Yeah. Well, how was he a character? I love to hear these stories about, you know. Well, he had been a choreographer, and he told me himself, he said, choreographers are known to be the cruelest people on earth. <laughs> and uh, he could be pretty cruel to some people. And um, the first picture I did with him was Footloose, and... It was the anniversary of my father's death. It was the second anniversary of my father's death. And he'd arranged a screening uh, of the film for his wife, Nora Kay, who was a uh, world famous ballerina before she retired and got fat. But she was fun. She was, she was a nice person, an interesting person. I don't know about nice, but uh, <laughs> uh, she was very interesting and very, uh, had ex excellent taste. And he ran everything by her. She had to approve everything. He would check with her on everything because he trusted her taste. And he had arranged the screening for her and another guy uh, who had been in their circle for many years, you know. And it was just the two of them sitting up front and Herbert and me were uh, sitting in the back near the fader. We could control the volume. And uh, 
I got to a point in the cut where I made a cut that he hadn't expected. He said, what did you do? I said, we talked about this. I said, you know, we're whispering to each other, right? He says, what did you do? You, you, you've ruined the scene. I said, I said I was going to do that. He says, that's not what I meant. I meant for you to, you know, and he started ragging. He said, you've ruined the screen. This is, you know, and I, I was already on edge because my, I was grieving my father, you know. Of course. I thought, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and get yelled at by this guy. So I got up and I walked out. So I'm now outside the Paramount screening room. The lot is deserted. I'm standing outside. It's at night. And I'm thinking, well, what do I do now? Mm. <laughs> I could go home and that would be the end of the movie, or I could go back inside. So I waited a few minutes, calmed down again, and I went back inside. I sat down next to him, and he leaned over. He said, I'm sorry. And we never had a problem ever again. Well, he, well, you did a couple of movies with him after that. Right? After that, yeah. Four, four, four. yeah. Now, this isn't a fair question. Yeah. And you may say Brian De Palma. Yeah. Have a favorite director? Has there been a favorite experience above all? A director who picks up the phone and there's just no question, I'm on board. Or is it all of them? I don't know. Many of them. Many of them. There's people, you know, at, at this point, uh, I'm, I'm retired. I haven't worked on a picture in, in four years now. Um, I was speaking to the producer who hired me on that picture. It was a, it was sort of a fix it uh, or you know extra pair of hands kind of situation. In fact, the producer was Mark Gordon. Was and, it source code? No. Oh. And uh, day after tomorrow? No. Oh, I got a <laughs> guess. I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Be patient. I'm going to get to it. I have my ways. So he says to me, so I was chatting with Mark. I hadn't spoken to him in a while and we caught up and he's always a pleasure to speak to. And he says, what was the last picture you worked on? I said, the Nutcracker in the Four Realms. Right. He says, really? I said, what was the last picture you worked on? He said, the Nutcracker in the Four Realms. <laughs> I said, a picture that ended two careers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a disappointment, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it was. I don't think the director's worked since then either. Although I hear he's got something going on, but yeah, well, I, it, I don't know. It's it's an interesting business. Uh, I will say this as far as interesting business, and maybe another thing that you could tell people who want to become editors is the idea that how important you after you're done with his show, and this is true of me, an independent director or anybody, is it's just about after you're done with somebody, you go home and you wait for the phone to ring. It's a very Interest. No matter how successful, this is a man that has done some of the most iconic movies in the business. But basically, am I right, Paul? When I'm speaking the truth, yeah. that even though you've done all these kind of things, you still, when at the end of the day, you just go home and wait for the phone to ring. Well, that's the wonderful thing about the business is that the phone rings mm -hmm. unexpectedly, and all of a sudden, your life changes for the better. Phone yes, if the in. phone rings, I agree. Phone call comes in from nowhere. And all of a sudden you're flying to London or, or your, your phone, or, you know, your phone rang a lot. Mm -hmm. my, to me, I, I was an actor for 30 years. It was like buying a lottery ticket every day. I felt like there was this chance that that phone call could be the ticket. It could be everything. And so it was always exciting to me. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, I'm going to jump around and go back because I've got all these things, but I did want to get to ask about this because I'm curious the Star Wars for George Lucas was a tough, tough movie to make. You write how depressed he got and how discouraged he got making that movie. Well, uh, I don't know if depressed is the word. He got anxious. He got terribly anxious. And he was under a lot of pressure. But George is a very tough guy, you know. And, uh, I mean, it's, an extra, it's hard to... Uh, put yourself back into the pre-Star Wars days, but, you know, it's hard to, to remember how uh, revolutionary everything that he did was. I mean, when you saw that picture, it was just, everything about it was so fresh and new and nothing like nothing you'd ever seen before. And at the same time, it was like everything you'd ever seen before. You know, it had the elements A of- Serial. Western or- you Right. Know, 
Robin Hood fighting the, the you know, Basil Rathbone in the castle or, you know, um, swinging across a moat, uh, World War II fighter planes. You know, when you watch Star Wars, you're not watching a movie, you're watching the movies. Right. It's, like, it's the whole thing all put together. Western bar with the, you know, the shootouts and the, I mean, it's got everything in it. And it's, yes, it's all at the same time, it's all fresh and new and, and like nothing you'd ever seen before. And yet, like everything you'd ever seen before, it's really kind of extraordinary. Did he direct anything after that? It turned him off to directing, yeah. didn't it? No, he directed the, it, uh, the prequel. Oh, the prequel, that's right. Yeah, he did. It, but he did say that that film, the original Star Wars, wore him out. So did Irvin Kirshner. He said that experience wore him out. It's, well, a, it's quite an undertaking, I'm guessing. Well, what happened was uh, George decided to finance the film himself. And from the merchandising. About, yeah, but talk about courage. You know, he's going to finance one of these films himself. He's not going to direct it. And the script that he's written with Larry Kasdan, you know, 99 out of 100 people after the success of Star Wars would have done cookie cutter copy of the first film with a big battle in the last reel. George puts the, the, the battle in the second reel. Mm -hmm. And at the end, there is no big battle. Right. And it ends with our heroes up a tree and the trees on fire, you know, and people have to wait three years to find out what happens next. Oh, I mean, okay. talk about, it painful. Of, talk about a set of cojones. I mean, that, yeah. that took really, that, that was extraordinarily, bold and brave and then he hires and then he hires a director uh whom he can't really control you know uh they schedule him for 16 weeks and they shot 29 weeks almost you know and george is paying for it out of his own pocket so talk about a difficult situation i mean mm -hmm. that that was really uh an extraordinary uh yeah but, uh, you know, I'm a kid through all of that. Not a kid, but I'm in college. The waiting three years, it enhanced the epic quality. We yeah. got so excited that you knew every next premiere was going to be a the, the new highest mark ever. Yeah. You know, for box office. It, it, it was a phenomenal concept. Still is. Well, actually, uh, Empire Strikes Back made less money than the first film or the third film. Hmm. People but didn't yet like, looked back at as look. really the best of all of that trilogy. Well, some say that. By a lot I, of critics. Yeah, a lot of people say that. But but what I'm saying is that that radical ending uh, didn't satisfy a lot of people. And they, you know, so it made less money than hmm. the other two in the first trilogy. Well, I'm sure he'll it'll make up. He'll find a way to make up money again. Future, merchandising, sure it'll, it'll merchandising. Work out. But you know that was part. You talk about back in the day, and this goes to uh, George Lucas and that whole uh, group of USC students, Francis Ford Coppola, who I know yeah. you worked with. Um, well, I never and, worked with him, but I. Oh well, he had Black Stallion, I believe you had. He was the producer. He was the yes, producer. right. Yeah. Um, but that time up there at George's ranch, was it considered a ranch at that point when you were doing Star Wars? Uh, no, he hadn't built it yet. No, I hadn't built it. But you had all these guys, people coming up. Steven Spielberg was coming up. Francis yeah. Ford Coppola was coming up. All yeah. of these young filmmakers were coming up. Yeah. Did you have like a feeling that, you know, they're all great or they're all good or were you surprised by any of it or? Uh, it was an exciting time. I met John Cordy, who was not, you know, well known uh, outside the Bay Area. He's one of those Bay Area, Bay Area filmmakers. Lovely guy. I met Michael Ritchie, mm. who had done Bad News Bears. And Michael was a terrific guy. Uh, died very young, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, who else did I mean? It's Matthew Robbins and Hal Barwood and all these guys. And, and um, I'm, I'm sure somebody will make a movie one day about those early days at uh, making Star Wars. Well, the, yeah, it, it just seems like that, you know, they talk about the golden age of Hollywood. For me, that was the, the golden age of Hollywood. You, you, were, you were the editor of the golden age of Hollywood. I mean, I have to, I got to go out with the fanboy that I came in with. 
Paul, you really were sitting the moviola of 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 history. Well, um, I, well, he did lucky. get he did get fired from Pluto Nash. I did. <laughs> I've well, been very lucky. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was your hey. Just reference the Oscar over your shoulder. It's not every day that we get to see an actual Oscar in in the in the in the frame. That is an Oscar right over your shoulder, right? Yeah, they give them out every year, Gary. Yeah, I, I've heard about it. Yeah, they, they, yeah. I, I don't have one. I don't have one, and I never will. I mean, I just, you know, uh, Paul. You could, probably, you could probably buy one on eBay somewhere. Probably, um, Paul. Just briefly, you know, you you're retired. Do you, do you ever feel like getting your fingers involved again? Are you retired? What what's you know, what's the day like there in, in the sunny California for Paul Hirsch? I don't have enough hours in the day to do everything I want to do. That said, sometimes what I want to do is take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> but, you... uh, I, I enjoy my freedom. Um, I'm not, I don't have to take any phone calls I don't want to take. Uh, I don't have to have any conversations with people I don't want to talk to. I, Kenny, uh, we made it. Yeah, we got no, under I'm the happy. wire. We got under the wire. I know we're saying goodbye, and I'm going to ask one question. I want to say one thing before. Oh you yes, go. please go ahead. I made a little film about my father. Mm. My father was a painter, and I made a little film about him. It's 15 minutes long. Uh, it was a, an idea that I came up with 50 years ago, and never, never completed. And I'd shot some footage, and it got lost. And I always felt this was a big failure in my life that I had never finished this film about my father. And then I realized recently that it didn't need that footage that I had shot because um, there are a lot of uh, copies of his work, of his paintings on the internet. So I was able to download a lot of his work and I wrote a narration and recorded it and, and cut it together and, and put some music to it. And I have a little film that's all about my dad who was um, collected in all the important museums of the country in the thirties. Mm. He was, um, uh, social realist and he painted people and um, uh, his his style of painting was uh, abandoned after the Second World War abstract expressionism came in and took over and then pop art and op art and all the other things so his style is sort of um, consigned to history but uh, when I made the film I sent it to Matt Robbins and he said you should show this you should show this to George you know he's building a museum George Lucas is building a museum. I, th I don't know if you know about it, but they tried to get it built in San Francisco in the, in the uh, Presidio, and they turned him down. Then he went to Chicago. He was going to get it built in Grant Park, and they turned him down. So now he's building it in an exposition park in L.A. next to the Coliseum, and it's extraordinary. I mean, it's going to be opening in a couple of years, and it's called the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. Oh, and wow. I'm writing George, this down. He wants it. Uh, he wants representational art in in the in the museum. So I sent him the film, and he called me up and he says, "I love the film and I love your father's art and it's exactly the kind of art I want to have in my museum." So this is what I've been part of what I've been doing in my in my spare time. Wow. That's not something we can YouTube right now, is it? No, I haven't put it out there. All right, but wow. I'll look forward to it. Yes, that's, absolutely. And that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it has been. And I'm working on another book about my life. My son said, why don't you write down anything you can remember from your childhood? So I started doing this. And I think it's a book that only the family is going to be interested in, but it has nothing really to do with the film business. It's just my life, not the film business. I, 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 your family and me, I find I, you to be a wise sage. Well, it was, I got to tell you, reading the book, I go, how did he remember all of this? I know. I, I don't great. remember last week yeah, in that detail. That do that. Thank you, Paul. Paul, it, it's been a real pleasure, a real pleasure. I am a fanboy. I've made that very clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time, folks. I know you've enjoyed this show. Thank you for watching. The Gary and Kenny Show is available on all the popular podcast platforms. We're also on streaming TV on DBNA TV Network. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Paul. Kenny, good to see you. Go jump in the pool and enjoy your good weather. <laughs> good luck, uh, gentlemen. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. Paul.